Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. All right, so on October 18th, I put together a fairly comprehensive set of gaming benchmarks covering a wide range of new Intel Core i7 and Core i5 processors and compared them to the AMD Ryzen range. Uh, in total, nine games were tested at 720p, 1080p, and 1440p using the second highest quality preset with a Radeon RX Vega 64 liquid-cooled graphics card. The focus of that video was stock out-of-the-box performance, but I noted that I also planned to create an overclocking version as well. So far, I have the numbers for the Ryzen 5 1600, though I thought rather than delay showing them to you for another week or two, let's compare the R5 1600 at 4 gigahertz to the Core i5 8400. I've been getting dozens of requests every day to make this comparison, so I thought I'd make it happen sooner rather than later. However, the video with all the benchmark results will be coming this time tomorrow. Today, I want to discuss a few things that came up in the previous video and will no doubt come up again in tomorrow's video. So rather than address all those comments individually, uh, let's just discuss them here and then I can skip this explanation at the start of tomorrow's benchmark video and just get on with all the benchmarks. Anyone who makes a comment about the topics or things covered in this video tomorrow will be linked back to this video. So, hello person complaining about 720p testing. Okay, so first let's talk about the graphics card choice. The Radeon RX Vega 64 liquid cooled has been used because it offers true DirectX 12 support and gives us a much better idea of how these multi-core CPUs will perform in modern titles using DirectX 12. Meanwhile, the GTX 1080 Ti, it does rely on driver trickery to offer DirectX 12 support and therefore doesn't take full or proper advantage of the more modern API. Since we aren't using ultra type settings in almost all of the games tested, and I am showing 720p results, Vega 64 liquid cooled isn't uh, the bottleneck that many made it out to be in the previous video. In fact, it's faster than the GTX 1080 Ti in the DirectX 12 titles tested, and the results in most of the DirectX 11 titles aren't that different, uh, especially at 720p, the margins certainly are very similar between the CPUs tested. Perhaps the biggest point of contention though was the 720p testing, which was included to help remove the graphics card as a potential bottleneck. Pro tip for other tech channels, if you want to weed out toxic AMD fanboys, include 720p testing in all your videos and be prepared to play whack-a-mole with YouTube's ban feature. <laughs> Seriously though, low resolution testing really is the only way to truly determine what kind of difference the CPU makes when it comes to gaming. That said though, it's not like I only included 720p results. Reading some of the comments on that video, you would certainly think that was the case, but no, it wasn't. Just as much focus was placed on the 1080p and 1440p testing. By the time you get to 1440p though, you're really no longer testing CPU performance for the most part. It's really a GPU benchmark then. But still, I included the 1440p results to satisfy those that requested it, and I really don't have a problem with providing a broader range of data when I can. Basically, anyone in the comment section going berserk over either the 720p or 1440p results uh, being included pretty much has an agenda. In my opinion, there really is no valid reason to demand that certain data sets be excluded. The more information we have, the better. I'll cover the low resolution topic in more detail with benchmarks very soon. For now though, I don't see how this information is misleading or hurts anyone. Anyone commenting that it is misleading or useless because no one plays at 720p sadly doesn't get why reviewers test at low resolutions for CPU benchmarks. Again, if 720p testing is provided alongside 1080p and even 1440p testing, then frankly you don't have a leg to stand on. Alright, moving on to the next issue, the Core i5. 8400 and here I want to talk about budget motherboards, enhanced multi-core support and pricing. First up, cheap motherboards. Next year we're expecting sub $100 US 300 series motherboards uh, supporting say the H370 and B360 chipsets to arrive and this will drastically reduce the cost per frame of the Core i5-8400 and my little charts at the end of the videos that I do. Then uh, this will make it a better value product and likely give AMD a few more headaches in the process. Uh, looking at the comment section of the previous video, it seems that AMD fans seem to be arguing that the Core i5-8400 will be slower on the more budget orientated 300 series motherboards uh, with these new affordable chipsets that I just spoke of. And I'm not 
really sure why that is. We've certainly never seen this in the past. The Core i7 7700K, for example, delivers the exact same performance out of the box on a H110 board as it does a Z270. That is, of course, assuming that you keep the memory speed at DDR4-2133 on the Z270 board. But yeah, performance doesn't change for the chipsets. Between the chipsets, why, why is that a new thing? <laughs> now, there are a few things to discuss here, and all of them were accounted for in my Core i5-8400 review. Officially, the 8400 supports DDR4 2666 memory, and this is the maximum memory speed that will be supported on motherboards that don't feature overclocking support, so that means B360 and H370 boards. All of the Core i5-8400 results that I've shown so far were gathered using DDR4-3200 memory, so in CPU-bound scenarios, the 8400 will be slower on cheaper motherboards using DDR4-2666 memory. It won't be drastically slower, but it will be slower all the same. Uh, getting back to the AMD fans, they also claimed that the base clock speed of the 8400 is suspicious, and Intel is pulling some kind of shifty move here. Uh, it's been suggested that Intel has handpicked the review samples, and while they can maintain a 3.8 gigahertz all-core operating frequency, uh, the, um, the review sample chips that is under load, uh, the retail chips they're saying uh, at least the bad ones, will drop down to the 2.8 gigahertz base frequency and therefore will see up to a 26% reduction in performance compared to the figures I showed in my review and the previous big benchmark video. Well, I've bought a retail chip and the results were identical to the Intel sample. Brian over at Tech Yes City bought two chips, not one, but two. Uh, he bought one locally and one from the US and they were also exactly the same as my Intel sample. As I understand it, the reason the Intel Core i5-8400 has such a low base clock frequency is because of its 65 watt TDP rating. For gaming and typical workloads, it can stay within the power profile with all six cores at 3.8 gigahertz. However, it can't achieve this for AVX2 workloads and therefore it has to drop down to 2.8 gigahertz to stay within the power spec. The 8600K, on the other hand, has been branded with a 95 watt TDP rating and therefore can maintain a higher base frequency for AVX2 workloads. The 8600K doesn't come with a cooler, so Intel can get away with making it a higher TDP part. If they did this with the 8400, they'd have to spend more money on providing a better cooler, and we know they're opposed to that idea, and really Intel just doesn't like cutting into profit margins. As for my testing with the Core i5-8400, well, I used a Z370 motherboard. There's simply no other choice right now for those buying this CPU for either using it or reviewing it. Uh, that being the case, I factored the cost of the Z370 motherboard into my cost per frame analysis. If you're going to buy an 8400 with a Z370 motherboard, which as I said, you have to right now, then you're not going to limit yourself to DDR4-2666 memory. So for now, that data is irrelevant. Despite using a Z370 board, I haven't been able to enable the enhanced multi-core feature on any of the ASRock, MSI, or Gigabyte boards that I've tested. People have told me you can do this on ASUS boards uh, and that it's enabled by default. I'm not sure if that's true or not. I think it's possible they might be getting a bit confused though. This is certainly the case for unlocked K models, but I haven't seen it confirmed by a reliable source for non-K locked models. Of course, it could be possible I just don't know yet as I don't have an ASUS Z370 board yet. Anyway, my testing hasn't been done with enhanced multi-core enabled. In fact, I've actually never enabled this feature for any of my CPU testing unless it was specified, and this has been the case for years now. I've always made sure it's disabled before testing. But as I said, in the case of the 8400, this feature isn't even available in the BIOS to be enabled. Finally, pricing. Now, Reviewers like myself typically base pricing on the MSRP, as this is generally the most accurate pricing metric there is. Uh, there is certainly very little point in taking sale prices into account, as they're generally only being offered for a limited time, and they are very region specific, so yeah, it does, doesn't really make sense to use those. I know guys are like, oh, the Ryzen 5 1600's this price, your pricing metric's all out of whack. It's like, well, yeah, I, I will go off current market prices. So I won't, for the Ryzen 5 1600, most of the Ryzen 5 processors in that previous video, I actually used prices that were below the MSRP, but yeah, they weren't micro center prices where they're selling the Ryzen 5 1600 for $18.55. Bit of sarcasm there. Right now, the Core i5-8400 can't be had anywhere near the $182 MSRP. In time, you'll no doubt be able to get it for that price, but right now, you just simply can't. In fact, you probably can't get one at all. 
So pricing comparisons are based on the MSRP, but I do note the current market price and conditions. There's no double standards here either. I reviewed the Radeon RX Vega 56 graphics card with the MSRP in mind. Shortly after release, it was selling for more like, I think it was $700 US, not the $400 US MSRP. That said, for follow-up content, I still based everything on the MSRP, but noted that availability and current market prices weren't great. Today, it still is overpriced, but it has come down a long way and now can be purchased for $470, and I'm hoping that early next year it will be at the $400 MSRP. So people watching that video next year, you know, won't be getting a skewed opinion on a price that no longer exists. Pricing certainly can be very volatile. We see this all the time, but the manufacturer suggested retail price. Well, it's a real thing. And under typical market conditions, that is the price you'll be faced with. As always, you do have to apply a little bit of common sense and be a bit realistic about all this. Um, we can't base pricing comparisons on the current retail price in every region, and really we shouldn't have to. Uh, these prices do change regularly, as I've seen, they can be quite volatile. And this is particularly true when a product has just been released. All that being said, it is my opinion that Intel has screwed up this release, or at least rushed yet another release, which has caused problems and it hasn't gone as well as it should have. So yeah, not arguing that at all or debating it. I completely agree with anyone who believes that. Uh, they're clearly feeling the heat from Ryzen and they've acted quickly, um, or as quickly as possible, and this has been the result. It's a bit of a messy release. Uh, anyway, that's going to do it for this one. Uh, I suspect there will be still people ranting about low resolution testing in the comment section below and all that, but I've now said my bit on the subject for now. I'm your host, Steve. See you again soon, guys. <laughs>